either Kent Beck is a genius and foresaw all of this, or he had a happy accident with the subtitle of his book, Embrace Change, <laughs> because, because it's about embracing change, but in a deep and fundamental way that touches on everything that we do. It's so, so, so I, I think he's probably a genius, but, yeah. <laughs> but, but uh, it really is about taking change as a fundamental of what we do. And in that world, we've got to be able to, you know, my, my thing in terms of, you know, what modern software engineering is about is that we've got to therefore optimize for learning continuously in this dynamic, you know, mishmash of environment software social you know interactions and so on and um and so optimize for learning to be able to keep on top of that and optimize to manage the complexity so we can survive it uh, and yeah. i'm increasingly of the mind that one of the tools to do that in terms of I, I think i think our industry would be in a much better shape if we if we could possibly agree to adopt the idea that the ability to change your software is the, is the defining characteristic of its quality. Mm -hmm. So the ability to change it. There are lots of other things that matter, <laughs> but if you can change it, you can change it to have those other things. You can change it mm -hmm. to be more secure, more resilient, faster, you know, nicer to use. You can do all of those things as long as you can keep changing it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so ideas like modularity and cohesion, separation concerns, uh, deeply at the level, at the technical level, but also at the organizational level. You need modular, cohesive organizations. Mm -hmm. You need teams that can, you know, with a good, you know, that are organized in a way with a good separation of concerns, so that you can have your stream aligned teams focus on the value for the organization and manage the cognitive load in the team in a way with supporting teams that help them to to do that yeah it's, it's an example of it's an example of where the, the the patterns for success so where if if you if 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 a person or an organization uh takes on board this mindset of we need to be able to change things with minimal friction yeah. And that change is, there, that is, is, is a really important property of our, of our software. And we're working in this changing internal and external ecosystem. And we need to, as you said, like be able to learn quickly about mm -hmm. all sorts of different stuff, how, how it works in production or, or what, these, what these new, um, if you like, requirements or, or business intent is. Find a way to learn really quickly about all of this stuff. If you've got that mindset, um, many things in this space look really strange. Yes. <laughs> like, for example, hey, it's actually better for us not to have a single database. It's yes. actually better for us to have multiple separate databases. And then there's yes. some kind of event event source or event-based uh, sort of synchronization, if you like, between them somehow, or we, we've got messaging. But if you were to speak to someone, I mean, certainly when I was studying and, 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 and in early in my career with software, the idea of multiple databases was like an anathema. Like you, 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 yeah. you'd be, be shown out of the building. You, you have a single database, and it's probably Oracle because that's <laughs> the one to use. Yeah, and and it's an example of where, um, where the patterns that look suitable for one operating context might look completely different from the patterns in a very different operating context. And you can't necessarily go immediately from one to the other. The organization has to go on a journey to build organizational awareness and organizational intelligence to get from, a, let's say, a relatively simple way of operating into a way of operating which, which acknowledges, at the very least, maybe even celebrates the kind of complexity and, and, and the, 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 the ecosystem aspect. You can't just go from one to the other. And and some some people who maybe their background is very traditional or they've not experienced this ecosystem way of thinking. For that, you know, maybe they're coming from like a project management background or they're coming from a very traditional architecture background or whatever. They 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 look at some of these new some of these the patterns aren't new, but anyway, they look at some of the patterns that are are are, are recently emerged and and and, and are, are are increasingly popular, like team topologies and what have you. And they look at them and they go, this seems crazy. Like, this seems really baffling. I can't understand why you would yeah. do that. And and, and they, they get, because it's so alien, because because the reason it's alien, 
is because it's actually acknowledging an operating context which is very different from the one that they're, they're familiar with. An operating context that is relatively predictable and straightforward. So in Kinevin terms, like it's simple or clear, I think it's called now. Mm -hmm. Uh, or, or complicated, so where you might add some expertise in there, and, and but it's still quite mechanistic. Mm -hmm. That kind of general mechanistic approach, which, which is, uh, you know, we've inherited from Taylorism and all this kind of stuff. Um, the, the assumption that it's just about a sausage machine. The patterns that work in here are are potentially very, very different from the patterns that work in, in this in, in an environment which is where we acknowledge the the complexity and and the the adaptiveness and the need for adaptiveness and, and that's a real challenge for lots of organizations because they've got many many people in there who think they're doing the right thing yeah by trying to project manage stuff or by trying to uh fix an end date or by trying yes. whatever it is that and, and in a particular operating context that might work yeah but we're not most organizations are no longer in that kind of operating context and the kind of software building is not that kind of software. It's not, you know, if, if I don't know, I've got an old, I don't know, I've got an old mobile phone here, right? This doesn't work. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> um, arguably, writing the software for something like this, which is, which is substantially disconnected, it doesn't have internet, right? It's substantially disconnected from, from, from other actors in the world via, via yeah. information networks. Arguably, you can kind of get a group of experts who can come together and build a set of software for that thing, which can get deployed onto it, and which is basically going to work in that context. But yeah. That's largely because it's kind of discrete. It's a closed system. It, it doesn't get influenced by other actors in this kind of information network. The, increasingly, software is not like that now. Increasingly, software is need, need to be able to respond to what's going on in the wider world. And it's impossible to predict that ahead of time. E and, and to, even, to uh, so, 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 so uh, again, too many things to unpick, <laughs> but 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 even then, e even even in those circumstances, my my experience, my observation is that even building those simpler systems by today's standards, maybe they certainly weren't simple at the time. Um, I think that often the the people that were actually doing the work were doing this in the kind of way that we're more likely to recognize mm. as being mm. good under the mm. covers of one of these more yep. bureaucratic you know approaches there's a lovely quote from margaret hamilton the the first software engineer who led the team to build the apollo guidance system software um and um, she, they were doing complex things with inertial navigation for the first time, and a computer that the astronauts could could use that you know has less power than you than, than probably these earbuds, let alone let alone your watch or your phone um, for the whole thing. Um, and one of the things she said is that you know um, during the time it went from nobody caring about how the complete freedom nobody caring how software was done because nobody thought software was important and so they had complete freedom to bureaucratic overkill when nasa tried to uh, apply you know you know, other, you know aviation style engineering to software and you know her team was spent all of their time trying to fend off the bureaucratic overkill and i think that's how my experience, my experience of working in those kind of big, more bureaucratic approaches was that if you, if you were on a good team, you get good people, then they'd still get stuff done. But they did it by breaking the rules of the, the process because the rules of the process didn't help and got in the way. Um, the the um, Yeah, it's, it, I, 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 I think that one of the ways that I've characterized the the, the 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 kind of problem that I think that you're talking about in the past is as is, is as a paradigm shift. I think that what we are talking about is genuinely a paradigm shift. And part of the problem with a paradigm shift is that the rules change. And so mm. the rules in the new paradigm look completely alien to the old one, and mm. the rules in the old paradigm don't hold for the new one. So if you try and apply the rules of the old paradigm, like you know, tell me who's going to be working on this feature in six months' time or when's it going to be ready exactly, you know, and let's fix the time and the scope. You know, those rules don't apply. They, they don't work. They, 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 don't, they don't apply to software, and, or mm. at least as we understand it. And so, 
you can't really have a conversation. I, I, I think at the conference that I mentioned in my in intro for you, the, the first pipeline conference, I did a talk on um, continuous delivery. And one of the things that I said there, the, 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 the subtitle for that talk was that, you know, what does good look like? Because I think that a, a huge part of the industry have never seen what a good mm. software project looks like. And that's a terrifying idea, but I think it's true. And so well-intentioned, smart people are doing the wrong things in those organizations. It's not that they're evil, but they're wrong. And then you talked about some of the people that have been pushing, that push back against team topologies. You know, you get some people that are making some money from the the big kind of, you know, paper over the cracks, agile processes that, 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 that are applied in those big organizations because they're more amenable to what big organization thinks agile is, but they're not agile in any sense that the founders or anybody that really practices it would recognize.